you know, mic audio, check the volume. Welcome, friends. You know, mic audio, check the volume. Sweet. Welcome, friends. Sounds good. You know, mic audio, check the volume. Sweet. <laughs> Welcome, friends. Sounds good. Welcome, yeah. everyone, to mic today's audio, board game design stream. <laughs> Making friends. sure last Welcome, few everyone, last to today's board game design stream. Just make sure everything is in order. Just make sure everything is in order. Excellent. Welcome to today's board game design stream. My name is Emma Larkins. I'm a Welcome tabletop to board game designer, among um, many, many other things. And a weekly stream where board game start from designers. zero. I'm um, um, coming into this totally things. blind and a uh, trying to come up with some ideas. Start from zero, potentially evolve into board games, and go a little bit into mechanics while I might work. I'm going to do a little bit of prototyping as well. Uh, and to go a little bit into mechanics while I might work. I'm going to do a little bit of prototyping as well. Sorry about the audio issue. That's super weird. Let me. Yeah, there we go. That should be better. I had the desktop audio on for an earlier stream. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? <laughs> yes. Infinite Echoes was going to be the name of today's game and of today's stream, but now we are uh, not doing Infinite Echoes, so hopefully that's a little better. <laughs> Should be fixed. All right, I'm going to sip on my coffee over here. Mm. It's been a long and intense couple of days on... Sunday, you might have caught me casting and streaming the Mox Gauntlet, this is awesome charity event the Mox Boarding House does every year. This year, they were raising money for El Centro uh, de la Raza, which is a Latino community and immigrant community cause where they, they dedicate to help these families adjust to life in the U.S. and become prosperous members of society. Uh, the event's really cool. We had a lot of board game tournaments, so people were playing Parade and Photosynthesis. Teams from around the Pacific Northwest, mostly big uh, video game and board game companies, like Bungie was there, Wizards of the Coast was there, all sorts of fun stuff. So I was casting that all of Sunday, and then yesterday playing uh, board games, D&D. And now we're making board games, so I hope you all came with... Uh, with your brains and your fresh, fresh ideas, so you can come up with some cool stuff today. Hello, Senior Bob. Senior Bob, and thanks for the thumbs up. Sounds like our sound is good to go. Ooh. That could be, if anyone has a keyword that they want to start with, feel free to drop it in chat. We could talk about sound or <laughs> echoes, although I think we did that a few weeks ago we came up with the cacophony game that I still need to finish prototyping. It's been a pretty busy few weeks, but definitely want to get back in there because I had the really cool sound waves that were going to be laid over each other, and I'm going to be laminating those cards so you can actually see through them. So it's going to be fun bits. I'm not sure exactly about the gameplay yet, but the making of the bits and the playing with the bits got a really good toy aspect to it. BF Trick says, Emma is a total noob to your channel. What is the format? What is the keyword you just mentioned? Absolutely. Have some new people in the chat today. So we're going to go over a little bit about what we do here. Flip back to our last mind map from last. This was weather last week? <laughs> I'm like, I think we did something between weather. No, we definitely did weather, uh, the cat hats and the weather. Yeah, that was a really good one. So let me get my notebook. 
put down here back in the camera. So the idea for the Game Design Daily board game concepting stream is we start from nothing, zero, nada. So no concept, no theme, no direction. Uh, a lot of it, oh, let me get my light turned on here so you can see that a little better. The main idea about it, for, for me, it's a great practice to get those creative juices flowing. Every week have a session where I'm not fixated a lot on all my backlog of, ide backlog, backlog of ideas that I want to work on, but instead come up with new and fresh stuff. I also think it's a great activity for other people if you're ever feeling stuck or you just want to make something new. So we start with our center word in our mind map. Last week it was weather. Start to do some ideation out from there. I really like mind mapping in particular as a brainstorming technique because it's a lot more free form and ideas come a little easier than a traditional linear brainstorm. So start from there, come up with some concepts, people in the chat chime in and yeah. Eventually it usually goes theme direction then, like talking about the Schrodinger's weather cats last week. We were talking about cats and weather and prediction and a little bit of uncertainty principle. Uh, but sometimes the actual inspirations from the mind map will lead directly to mechanics. Either way, we eventually talk it through, start to come up with some ideas. Um, reminds me I need a new one of these. Wow, oh, I'll make a copy. We have our notes here on the left hand side first and this is where we start to write down some of those ideas so we have the beginning of a rules document or a game design document you might say uh, and from there eventually like if you see anything another cool thing about this stream is if you see anything that inspires you to create games Feel free to grab and take whatever you want. None of these, they're just ideas. They're not owned by anyone. Uh, and I often find things here that during later sessions I will prototype and work on. Yeah, that's about it. Chris Kine, looking for a keyword, maybe travel. Travel is good. It is the season of travel. I know in Seattle in particular, people tend to hunker down during the winter months. Sometimes escape to warm places, but other times just hibernate until spring and summer come. Then we go out, travel the world, go hiking, get some fresh air, get some nature. If you are in the board game industry, it is also the season of travel because we have a lot of conventions coming up. I mentioned being busy. One of the things I'm working on is pitches and prototypes for upcoming conventions, including Evergreen Tabletop Expo, uh, <laughs> which is not this weekend, which I was thinking about. I was like, oh my gosh, that's this weekend. It's like the 27th. It's only the 21st, so that's, that's great news. Uh, Evergreen Tabletop Expo in uh, Washington in Renton or Bellevue or somewhere. It's nearby. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be judging the uh, Lucy Awards along with a bunch of other awesome judges, Chris included. Uh, we also have Origins coming up in the middle of June, Gen Con, of course, um, towards the end of July. I know Geekway either just happened or people are doing that. Uh, Stumptown Game Summit was another big one. So yeah, a lot of travel in our industry right now. So when you think about travel, you can think of different uh, train, plane, train. You think of def different methods or vehicles of transportation. Uh, trains in particular, big theme among board games and board gamers. On the Table Takes Gen Con stream last week, we were talking about um, 18 Chesapeake, I think, an 18xx game up on Kickstarter right now, and I was mentioning how, sadly, I haven't gotten to play an 18xx game yet. This one in particular is supposed to be a more accessible one, because I know a lot of the 18xx games can be uh, quite involved, 
Uh, for those of you who don't know 18xx games, they usually set sometime in the 1800s, hence the 18 and the X's. They have locations or the, a year that goes along with it, and then it's just trains and uh, transportation, pick up and deliver, moving stuff, building the train routes. Um, <laughs> sometimes I make fun of these, uh, I'm going to put 18xx down here, just because I'm thinking about it now. Sometimes I make fun of this. Or just the trains you go into a, a your local game store. Often you'll see walls of train games. Just like, why are there so many train games? It seems kind of weird. Like very oddly specific, right? Of all the different routing things you can imagine. Uh, but I think it really calls back to the core of board gaming, hobby board gaming, heavier hobby board gaming in particular and this very meticulous uh, strategy over time of building out building out the routes, using the routes. There's a lot of interaction for, for some of the games using other people's routes. I know a lot of times there'll be an auction or bidding element. So these games are very uh, thinky, heavy, in-depth experiences, all based around trains. Origins, yeah! I'm excited for Origins. It's my first time going to Origins. Excited to meet a bunch of designers, meet a bunch of publishers, kind of going there blind. Gonna set up some meetings, but mostly just be walking around chatting with people. Travel is sometimes a puzzle of finding food before anyone gets cranky. Oh my gosh, Chris, you're so right. Uh, food. I'm gonna put food as a separate thing here. Uh, and then hangry as a sufferer of hangriness, a lifelong sufferer of hangriness myself, I am well aware of the negative impacts of this, this horrible, horrible disease, which is more like uh, my, like, I don't want to speak for other people, but for me, I feel like it's my failure to self-manage and track my hunger levels or just forgetting to eat. Um, so yeah, fitting in different meal scheduling and food uh getting food for a group of people with different food requirements restrictions needs is definitely something i thought about before i love food games i love making food games and just the idea of food in general uh, so this idea of having to like balance the the needs of different people is very interesting specifically when traveling because you definitely have some limitations there other game, um, yeah, so let's make a note of that, actually. Uh, managing food on the road is what I'll write down. Managing food on the road. Uh, speaking of food games, Chris, I know you're watching. Uh, that reminds me of the fridge game. I haven't seen that in a while. I'm excited. Uh, I remember having a lot of fun with that, so... I know you're working on a ton of stuff right now, but I'd love to see the, the fridge game come back at some point. Uh, gifts, uh, souvenirs, yeah. Souvenirs is a really cool thing. Um, gifts, for, gifts for people. Uh, right away, there's a couple of really cool directions you can go with this, right, as being an American, thinking about Americana, having a map, having the different souvenirs from the different locations. You could have a very theme heavy game that dug into all those kinds of things. Uh, but then you could have like different locations, right? And potentially based on the location, if you're going to Europe, if you're going to India, you can have a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool regional items and really get uh, deep into the flavor of these kinds of souvenirs. Personal care versus sightseeing. Yeah. Um, yeah, like a scheduling time management, I think. MGMT. And personal care. Sites. I think that's 
it's a really interesting thing when you're going traveling. I do a fair amount of traveling. Over the last few years, it's been mostly business stuff. So it's a lot of going to the convention, scarfing food, very busy times. But I've done non-business travel in the past as well. And you, you tend to think that you're going to be uh, a different person when you go traveling, right? You're like, oh, <laughs> sure, when I am at home, I, I sleep until noon on the weekends, and I kind of prefer to be a homebody instead of going out or whatever, however you are. But you think when you go traveling, I'm going to be up at 6 a.m. every morning, I'm going to have like 12-hour days, I'm going to go and go on the trains and have all this energy. Mm. Which it can be good to break out of your normal routines. Uh, which I'm going to make a note up here about that too. It can be good to break out of your normal routines. But you're right, it's in your bowel. There's definitely a balance there of <laughs> the ambitions of travel versus the realities of travel. Ambitions of travel versus realities of travel. All right. Fridge game will come back. Yay, Chris. That's great. <laughs> Tourist attractions, traps. Yeah. I think the whole year of souvenirs, tourism, locations. Oh, man. I'm going to type this one, actually, because I was thinking all of this... Uh, Souvenirs, Americana, uh, tourist traps, map location. For the tourist locations in particular, I'm seeing this like map, uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego vibe. So, not necessarily the whole Carmen San Diego thing with like the chasing down this super villain across the world, right? But having, going to different locations and interacting with them in a certain way. Uh, interacting with tourist locations in particular and, <laughs> particular and getting souvenirs from those places. You're mad because I put all the stuff back in the drawer. The cats were very insistent that they had to sit in this drawer. You're going to sit on top of all the stuff that's in there. <laughs> Anyways, how long until the next rest, drop, rest stop? Are we there yet? Oh my gosh. Is there? Okay, sorry. Sidebar. I'm going to... Are we there yet? Is there a board game called Are We There Yet? Oh my gosh, there totally is. Of course there is. Ah, oh, that's such a good name. Maybe I could steal that name. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll think about it. <laughs> that's a really good name. Racing to get family photos with weird, sometimes not impressive landscapes. There could be like a selfies element to it. Um, ooh. Like a set collection, going around to the different ones, trying to plan routes. So maybe some of that 18xx route planning, best, fastest routes to collect your family photos first. And this could be, again, this game is already feeling pretty flavorable, flavorable, flavorful, flavorable. I don't know if that's a word. Flavorful. Thematically flavorful with uh, some light mechanics to it. So just component-wise, I'm imagining like a Polaroid-sized bits. Polaroid? Polaroid? I don't know how to spell Polaroid. Polaroid, haha, nailed it. Polaroids. Polaroid sized bits where you're actually collecting the things and they have family photos. Uh, <laughs> mechanically, that could be interesting. Whether each person has their own family and their own set 
or whether you can just get any. So you're taking other people's family photos. Uh, so that's kind of a weird idea, right? For, because mechanically, unless you do some crazy high tech or have a digital screen implementation, which could be a cool idea. I'm gonna make that as a note, because that could be fun. I haven't really worked on a digitally implemented board game yet, but that could be a cool idea for one. But if they are actually physical components and it is a picture of a family in front of a landmark, um, either it's all the same family, which is kind of weird, or they're all different families and you just collect one. It's like, oh, this is us at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> uh, and people be like, but that's, you don't have that many kids. Did you have another child jump in the photo? Or maybe your whole family splits up and goes to different locations and, and you're kind of, uh, faking these travel photos. Puts up to, or we could go even super meta with it, right? Like they're not, you're not even going to these locations. You're like photoshopping yourself into these fancy special locations. Hi, okay. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the longest road mechanic. Right, says so the longest distance traveled. Senior Bao mentioned highway billboards. Huh. Which is funny. I don't know how many games mechanically use highway billboards, but Food Chain Magnet definitely does. Not highway billboards so much as you plonk a billboard right outside someone's window of their house to get them to eat pizza or burgers, which is really funny. But highway, highway billboards, oh man, that could be really cool too. Uh, I, I like, I love driving. I love road trips. I don't have a car right now, so I haven't been able to go on any in a while. But I think you see some really funny, interesting, amazing things along the way when you do take a road trip. Uh, so highway billboards could be a cool, fun set collection idea instead of having your family that you're traveling with you're taking pictures of these highway billboards and that would be a really fun way to inject flavor into this game because uh, you could just make some really hilarious funny one like iguana lawyers uh are you tired of being represented by warm-blooded humans talk to the cold-blooded iguanas and get your money for reals like, you just have some really fun flavor like iguana lawyers. <laughs> I love the depth of my note taking for these sessions that we have here. Uh, sometimes everything I remember what we were talking about but other times I come back and I'm like iguana? Iguana lawyers? Is that? Camera come back to me. Is that? Is that? That's weird. You take Takedo and you Ameritrash it up to get that American road trip. Americana road trip. Which means you need to roll big chunky dice, obviously. Right. I'm putting that straight into the dock because that is golden. Takedo is a really interesting place to start for this, now that I think of it. If you hadn't had a chance to play Takedo, it's... I, it's really unique as a board game and it kind of takes a little bit of the roll roll and move very traditional mechanic monopoly sorry uh, shoots and ladders anything you can imagine roll and move a more traditional mechanic that a lot of modern game designers kind of frown on because you don't have a ton of agency but for Takedo you're moving but instead of using the dice to randomize you got to choose any spot to go to uh, within the length of road that you're in but obviously the more places you stop the more things you're going to get that can give you points and there's a little jockeying so only a certain number of people can be on each space so really cool really clever mechanics and the beautiful theme of this game emphasizes the feeling of uh, <laughs> a journey across the japanese countryside because this 
Tokaido trek is actually a real place and a real thing. Uh, and I do... Uh, so I really enjoy the game. I think there's a lot of clever stuff going on there. I love this idea of throwing in... <laughs> just trashy. Yeah. <laughs> a mirror trashing it up. I think it would be really cool... Um, to be able to capture some of the feel, mechanical feel of Takedo. So still have some agency, still have some control, and interesting decisions. So we're not exactly going into roll and move here, but just throw in some more typical uh, Ameritrash type things. Uh, if, if you haven't heard of the term of Ameritrash, it's a little bit condescending towards uh, some games that are quite different from the Euro style of game, where Euro style is definitely very thinky, very heads down, interaction is not direct, uh, it's more subtle, you have a little more control, there aren't as many swingy things often in the game. Whereas the Ameritrash is often minis, you're going to combat, you're beating each other up, there's a little bit, there's more dice. Euros usually don't have dice or a lot of randomization elements. Yeah, so taking just the map and you're like moving around, you can choose where you go, but then like really uh, fun chaotic stuff happens. Uh fun chaotic stuff happens like fighting over getting pictures of cool stuff and as with the the Takedo is a more traditional game it's not super modern with the journey you're taking so you're eating food you're getting souvenirs and I believe you're painting watercolor pictures of the landscape so for this new modern edition you're gonna be taking photos taking selfies uh, going to like the world's biggest dinosaur park or whatever, what have you. I like this too because it taps a little into the game that I've been working on that's kind of been trickling in my brain called Sofas for Sale, which is kind of worker placement area control-ish where you're trying to get your meeples around, sit on the sofas to claim them, uh, and it does have this kind of I don't know, at least for me, 90s, like, I don't want to say trashy exactly, but very retro, like for me as a kid going to like the carpet store or the discount furniture store in Sofas for Sale, it's Ernie's Discount Furniture Emporium, you know, you see these places in the strip mall, and it's like the closing sale, everything must go, but it, the store's been around for like 20 years, like a lot of that, uh, feel is a cool vibe that I don't know if a lot of board games really tapped into. Chris says, highway billboards actually start to create an interesting graphic design direction. You can totally use the font and color scheme. Oh, the brown, green, blue. Yeah. That was actually uh, for the overall graphic design direction. There's a very strong feel to that. We're talking of like a little touristy, a little trashy maybe, like campy sort of stuff. There's also the other direction of the um, national parks sort of a theme and travel. So it could be very, you know, like touristy things, but it could also be going around to different parks which is really cool aesthetically because this was actually an aesthetic assessment I did for uh, And Then We Died back when it was Confabio Rasa, one of the design directions I was exploring was giving it like a kids camp sort of a feel. So I looked into um, I looked into a lot of the thing <laughs> what really gr a way I feel like I can put it that maybe means something to people my age or older, uh, Yogi, Yogi the Bear, Yogi Bear, I say National Park Signs. And that's a very interesting, yeah, oh 
Man, yeah, there we go. Oh, that is so nostalgic. I don't know about for you, but for me, just this idea of like the wood, of the yellow, of the fonts, this. All right, for that uh, kind of mix of 50s space age Jetsons with like the nature, uh, postmodern maybe. I don't know what the right term for that is, but. national and there's such a strong design language even if you don't go obviously you don't want to go infringing into like the world of the parks uh i don't know who owns that maybe the government uh, maybe that's actually public domain you can get a lot of feel for this kind of mix of uh cursive and or italic and non-italic fonts uh there's the shapes I want to call it like the Jetson shape. Back in that 50s era, it was all about kind of like the dramatic yet rounded shapes. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff there. <laughs> Senior Balb says Amish Furniture, world's largest twine ball, fireworks outlet store. All right. Coming back from our national park sidebar, we might veer, we might take a journey into that, come back, go out and come back, go out and come back. Uh, but I think there's, for anyone who spent time road tripping or traveling across the, the United States, which I have a lot actually, we drove from California to Maine when I was about 10 years old because we moved across there, spent a lot of time as a kid in California, Nevada, the West Coast, all along the East Coast, down been to Florida, uh, been many places in Texas, the mill area with the, the U Utah, Colorado, and then down into the Southwest. And there's a lot of iconographic locations and places that you might not instantly recognize all of them, but there's that little bit of nostalgia. Like when you say fire fireworks outlet stores, if you haven't traveled a ton, and depending on the, the location you are, you might be like, what? what? Fireworks? They're selling that? But if you live um, near Pennsylvania, I know, it's, the state laws are weird, right? So from Maryland to Pennsylvania, there's one that's right across the state border. Uh, and I think that, I'm going to write that down, right across the state border. I think that that's one of the core interesting parts of what a game like this would encapsulate, is this idea of so close and yet so far. So close and yet so far. It's close enough to reach out and grab, and the hardest part is just getting going. Because I think that's a really cool thing about travel, and travel in the US in particular, is once you start going and crossing state lines, or even just going, if you're in a big state like Washington, just going east from from the coast where we're located here in Seattle it can be it, and you're not sure your destination like what I want to check out but if you just start going you're gonna see all these things that you never realize were there and it's like wow this is so close we never come out here but there's this whole world out here all right what else we got here Chris says, I think it's worth saying that it's totally okay to start with an inspiration that's Tokaido, but ideas may start derivative, but soon you're riffing off of new stuff and end up with something truly unique. Uh, for those of you who don't know Chris, Chris is a genius, uh, has some very smart stuff here in the chat and just in general. Uh, if you see Chris, place is also going to be at Evergreen Tabletop Expo. Uh, I'm not sure about Origins, Gen Con probably. Um, 
But yeah, this is a really good point that Chris makes here. And I think it can be a hang up for especially beginning designers. For example, I was at uh, Mox Boarding House the other day. Uh, one of my friends was showing off a new design to someone who's not a designer. And the person who was not a designer was like, oh, this is just couriers. Uh, and the, the, this new designer looked as like, oh, is that, I, I don't think they had played quarters and they seemed kind of sad or taken aback by that. It's like, that is totally okay. Like there's so many games, uh, that's Takedo but that's Quarriors, but that's Quicks, but, or Yahtzee, but, you know, games there, mechanically, there isn't that much space to explore it's just like writing a book you know like oh this is just the hero's journey yeah but it doesn't mean it's not a good book so starting inspirationally from a direction from a game like Taito to Kaido especially a good game and especially as I had mentioned to Kaido puts things together in a really unique and interesting both mechanically and graphically way uh, I forget if there's three stops or four. There might just be three. But it has this really cool center line with the main places that you have to stop. So I guess one of the nice things that this solves is instead of saying like, oh, you can go anywhere along this track, you know, you have to stop at the uh, town centers. Or I forget the word. Those are the places where you get food. Uh, which is really cool, and they have beautiful pictures on the cards, the foods that you can get. Uh, if you're the last person, draw a little meeple here. If you're the last player back, then you're the first to move. So you move anywhere where there aren't other people, uh, as long as you don't move past these certain checkpoints here. I'm just stopping along the way and trying to collect stuff. So it really simplifies directional movement you know you don't have to count up the number of spaces you're doing it's a self-balancing mechanic because you know other people can kind of jump in front and get the sort of stuff you want to get if you go too far ahead yeah you're going to get that one really good thing but you're going to miss out on everything in between and that lets the people behind you kind of just take these little baby steps and move down along the track uh, is really interesting and if we do go to like a whole map thing I'm gonna draw the country that's what the US looks like right sure <laughs> I was like a Florida actually like I said I lived in Maine for a while so it's more like a, a cowboy hat or like a a dog up here, so it's kind of a sad thing. More like that. That was a little better. So if you're looking at it like this, and we're taking this to Kaido, sort of a travel concept, an interesting design direction for this would be to explore, can we do something that's not necessarily, uh, that's not necessarily linear, and have this same sort of a feel. Because the nice thing about the linear track is that you're only going to go, like you can track who's farthest behind. So it's a very clean, very elegant way of showing who's going to go next. So that priority, so to speak, could be a little bit different uh, for having a more, for having a non-linear track. It could be a little interesting to see exactly how that works but you could still have the same thing of nodes with limited occupation so let's think about the game Takedo. if you're playing in the lower player count only one person per space higher player count two people per space but there's definitely a limitation to the actions there um, with this kind of going around the map you might have to have, uh, so this first diagram up here, we're looking at just total chaos. You can move anywhere at any time. If you want the game to have more of a progression, um, 
and not be worried about people just kind of bouncing around. Like, when does the game end? You know, it's, it's a thing, it's a good thing to think about even when you're starting the game, just so you don't go in a, kind of a weird design direction. But if you look at this here, this first map up here is like just the chaos, you're moving stuff around, going wherever you feel like. But you could also do uh, tracks with like sidebars, but you're only moving, only ever moving in one direction. And maybe these things come back and recombine. Uh, but so the movement is still somewhat directional and linear, but you have potentially multiple tracks and branching tracks that you can go off of instead of the one track from Takedo. So, <laughs> shh, shh, say no, 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 it's, it's here, right? I knew I was missing something. It's like, that looks mostly right. Yeah, sorry, Texas. Oh man, I feel bad now. Sorry, Texas. Okay, you're in there now. Texas is, <laughs> I was gonna be like, Texas is great. Texas, uh, Definitely has some stuff going on, but I've been to places like San Antonio and um, okay, we're San Antonio and Austin. There's definitely places there where they're doing a lot to have game design, mostly video game design, but they have a lot of cool tech stuff going on there, and also with conventions and the things that they're having there, uh, trying to be a little more progressive and support uh, the people doing the stuff down there. <laughs> I did want to tap back into what Senor Baub mentioned up here with the feedback faux pas. I had mentioned that I overheard some feedback from a non-game designer from a gamer, non-game designer, to a game designer about their game being like another game. I think that's, that's something that's important to realize when giving feedback to a new designer in particular, because if I tell one of my experienced game designers, like, oh, first of all, I wouldn't say, like, oh, this is just X game, because obviously it's not, unless they've literally reproduced it piece by piece. I, I would be more likely to say something like, oh, this is cool, I like how you use the elements like this, it reminds me of Couriers. Uh, so part of it is that feedback, don't say, don't tell someone the game is just like a thing, unless it's like literally could be mistaken for rip, being a ripoff of that game. And then you might want to mention like, hey, you know, it's, it's a little too similar to this other game, uh, you might have some issues with that. Uh, but again, it's very hard to coalesce on the exact same type of a game unless you literally are riffing off of something. Uh, but yeah, from a design perspective, you are a starting out designer and someone says that your game is similar to an existing game, uh, that's great. That means often you should either watch a video of that game or ideally play through that game, see what that game is doing, see what your game is doing differently. Uh, and in the past, and in the future, when someone says like, "Hey, this reminds me of that," it's like, "Yeah, that's a great game. I'm excited that you think of that game when you play my game. Hopefully, in a good way." <laughs> oh man, sorry, Texas. I just want. How did I miss that? I <laughs> I was so excited about my ability to draw this U.S. map, and then. And then totally flubbed on that part of it. Uh, yeah, so we're talking about this route movement, um, not set collection, not really pick up and deliver along the routes, but you're going to different locations, collecting different items relevant to those locations. Uh, as we're doing an exploration here, important, you know, the first thing that I think of here is a map with the roads, you travel along the roads, you go to the locations, like that is immediately apparent to me, logically, as something that makes sense for this type of a game, but it doesn't have to be like that, and it can be useful to look at different potential layouts, movements, uh, 
And for example, like we're talking about a road trip, right? So logically it would make sense you get in your car and you drive to these different locations, but what about other forms of travel? What if you're doing, uh, if you're going by planes, right? To these different locations. In that case, it's not necessarily linear, right? Planes can be much more of hopping around to any location, so it could make more sense um, instead of being a map, it could be a grid. The locations could be more uh, figurative as opposed to literal. Lots of fun stuff that you could do with that. The map is pretty evocative. Um, right away looking at it and there's a lot of graphical things you can do to communicate the action of the game which is nice but then other questions become stuff like do i want to do uh, if you're starting to look at a game like this that taps into real world things how real world do i want to be how much agency do i want to have between the different things, the flavor I'm trying to accomplish, and having to stick close to reality, right? So for example, do I want to use existing roads? Mechanically, and, and, oh my gosh, yeah, we need a US map now. US road map, yeah. Ooh, yeah, look at that. This, yes, there we go. So you can see, Obviously, there's a lot of rows across the US. Do I want to try and copy some of this mechanically? You can see the way that the roads are laid out from a board game perspective. If I'm gonna go here to the East Coast and try and stick a little closer to what the roads are, uh, it's a little more dense over here. The population is much more dense over here. So for my board that I have laid out, do I wanna copy this literally? Or do I want to have the agency or control to be a little more figurative with it and have more control over where stuff appears? You know, do I want to cram a bunch of stuff on the East Coast and then have uh, bubbles pointing out to like blow up to have the pictures of those locations? Um, or do I just want to make up, you know, just draw a line from town to town <laughs> that's not a, a real Act, real actual road. And the other thing is, do I want to use known places like the, the biggest ball of twine? Or do I want to, and with any rights, or do I need to get permission to use those locations? Or do I want to try and make something up like the biggest ball of cheese? And maybe those things exist as well. So this is, when you're talking about a more realistic game like this. There's a lot of stuff, um, a lot of fun stuff, interesting to dig into. Chris says, getting lost, refusing to stop for directions, spilling coffee on your map. The roads could have backed up traffic. I like this. So, so far, uh, just to do a little bit of recap, what we talked about throughout the course of the stream. We have this idea of going across the country, going to tourist locations, set collection. Uh, it's all, it's interesting. There's some potentially Takedo-like mechanics for how you go to those locations. Um, it's a, and it's a good start. I think there's some really cool stuff here. But now like what Chris is saying is like, how can we like get something more exciting in there, I guess. Because uh, I think Takedo is a very relaxing, peaceful game. It is competitive, but it has that feeling of a leisure leisurely travel. But what if we went in a different direction? You know, we're trying to implement some chaos into this. Uh, so instead of having an easy journey where we have just a lot of control, we're just kind of tootling along what if we're talking about a journey with obstacles, right? What kind of cool, fun obstacles could we play around with? Um, and I like the flavor for this. Refusing to stop for directions, spilling coffee. Now the coffee roads are a thing, and you have to navigate those. 
and the the backed up traffic as well. Uh, <laughs> navigating traffic, the game that could be a whole other game. Chris says now boarding is a great example of a simplified map of the U.S. Graph with few nodes, easy to follow. Um, now boarding and it's map of the US. And this is another thing about tapping into existing learning from other games. Having a game, like looking at different map games and seeing how they've solved uh, some of these challenges in the past can be a useful place to start to riff off of. <laughs> Plain focus, right? Uh, now boarding is, I haven't got a chance to play it yet. I think it's cooperative but you're doing, you're planning routes plane wise and kind of bouncing around the company. <laughs> I'd go see the biggest ball of cheese. It depends if it's like, I don't know, it depends on the size. I feel if it's like five foot diameter or larger and how long it's been around for, like how long, cheese doesn't last forever. So that would be my only concern with seeing the biggest ball of cheese. Mm -hmm. World's largest mousetrap. For the lar world's uh, largest mouse. <laughs> Didn't the Simpsons have a wig tower thing? Is that a real thing? American roadside attractions are pretty hard to tell from reality. And that's the funny part. Uh, we were talking about our game Truth of Science a few weeks back where you had to prove which things are real and which aren't. Uh, which roadside attractions are real? And that could be a fun part of the game, right? Or maybe a different game, perhaps. Just like, what is a real roadside attraction? There's so much stuff that could be, and everyone's trying to jockey uh, tourists. <laughs> so there's a sun sphere. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure about the wing tower, if that's a real thing or not. But it could be, right? I believe that it's a real thing. So many of these, and I mean, this is an interesting thing historically, if we're going into why this whole roadside attraction became a thing, why people got into the biggest ball of twine or the rubber band ball, or uh, just museums of different things, like cat relics museums, either local or cultural or just weird things. They're attractions, right? So much of the livelihood of places along the U.S. highway routes comes down to this tourism and how you can kind of pull people over to your town um, versus the next town over and get those tourist dollars from going to the hotel, getting something to eat, just hanging out there having the people tell other people about their towns. Uh, sidebar, this makes me think, talking about like the reason, the history about these roadside attractions and why they kind of came to be. I say came to be, but I'm sure they had them. I'm sure they've been around for as long as roads have been around, right? Like back in ancient Rome or wherever they did a lot of road stuff. Uh, or just bards traveling across the countryside. It's like, oh, we have fantastic wine in our region, or we've got an amazing castle. You should come visit that. Uh, so yeah, it could be cool. There's the travel element idea to it, but if you're actually the towns competing to make the best roadside attractions, uh, you have some really fun, silly ones to jockey over or argue over. And for my idea of this game, you would actually... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to uh, draw my, my map again. This time with Texas, Florida, Maine. All right, that's a better map. How's that map? Uh, Texas has like another nub down here. A double nub. Okay, it's close enough. Uh, so instead of playing just one town, you have a selection of towns. 
instead of traveling, you're a developer trying to build up. Building up attractions in different cities, maybe a chain of attractions, or there could be a chain bonus. Uh, so you would be able to put up a thing for the, the biggest ball of twine. You know, you'd have to somehow earn the right to make the biggest ball of twine. Uh, instead of necessarily owning the cities, you might be able to just choose a city and build it there. <laughs> I love this idea of um, roadside attraction tycoons. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre and doesn't really make that much sense, but just this idea of people going from town to town, just like building these up and like getting the revenue from them. And then your town gets more tourism. So there's some fun stuff there. Following a rock band tour. I like that too. It's got that cool like rock feel to it. So that that idea is cool too. Some classic literature is based on travel, like the Odyssey. Chris says, flipping it on its head. What if you're the one making roadside attractions, trying to pull in tourists? So my great minds think a lot, think alike. <laughs> uh, Chris and I had talked a little bit before since you are local, Chris, about the uh, the delay between me talking and seeing your messages. This is a cool moment, right? Where we were talking about this um, and you had this idea and I had the idea at the same time. <laughs> Roadside tycoon. That's great. Put up billboards in front of people's houses. Oh, Chris also played Food Chain Mag Magnet with me, so we both have this uh, memory of putting up the billboards in front of people's houses. They must see the world's largest mousetrap, Roadside ta Tycoon. <laughs> One of the things I like to do while designing is totally not necessary and probably not that useful either. Uh, but I like to Google the names of some of the, the cooler ideas and see if that's actually a thing. Tycoon games on Congregate. There's a whole genre of tycoon games where you're going around and building up a bunch of stuff. Doesn't look like there is a roadside tycoons. So I'm going to at least make that the name for this particular stream because that sounds fun and cool. I like both of these. Uh, so to do a quick recap of what we've come up with so far, we have a couple of different directions. Probably end up, if I move forward or if anyone moves forward with these ideas, in two different directions. One of more a travel set collection, really flavorful thematic game of going around visiting different locations and collecting items from those either collecting pictures or collecting actual souvenirs oh my gosh it was like a toys minis game uh toys so I had talked about collecting cards or photos of the places you went to, or you could do cards of souvenirs, or if you wanted to get really crazy with uh, making a bunch of minis, you could make the actual souvenirs of like a snow globe you could collect, or like a lighter, or the a little mini Eiffel Tower, different cool things. Uh, yeah. So we talked in the one direction that we started from our travel mind map over here it's going around actually doing the travel but that discussion eventually evolved into what if we were making these attractions that tourists were coming to and you're choosing the different locations and trying to lure people to these places sounds like it would probably be a little more complex maybe a little more euro-y style thinky gameplay to 
populating these roadside attractions around the the map, trying to claim the different places. <laughs> there could still be a travel element to that game direction, though, if you had to... Um, so we're thinking a starter tycoon, right? Not necessarily I'm an ad advanced tycoon who can just jet around the country. I still don't have a ton of money, so I need to slowly make my way across the country, setting up ro roadside attractions as I go as this tycoon person that I have become. Attractions. Still have the travel over time element. Uh, yeah. So that could be more, potentially a more simplified version instead of just going anywhere on the map and building these things up. Uh, there's a little bit of movement thing, or even a ticket to ride type of a situation where you're putting some sort of items or collections onto the board uh, to kind of claim a location. And it's at the, the end game scoring would be more about the locations that you have instead of trying to calculate a uh, flow of tourism. Calculating flow of tourism over time, it's more complex mathematical model versus ticket to ride uh, type claiming of locations. I'm gonna say instead of in ticket to ride you're claiming the routes. And this would be like claiming the actual locations. <laughs> Play a lot of railroad tycoon as a youngling. Chris says, I've never played the networks, but I know it's got that thing where you have a new show and it gets less popular over time. That seems like the fate of the roadside attractions too. You need to arbitrarily spice it up. Uh yeah, networks is great. Gilhova's game. Uh, the decay over time is really cool with the shows and you could put, uh, it's definitely something you could do in a game like this. What's really cool about them is each show has a different arc to it. Uh, and that's really fascinating to see some of these things, you know, they might start out really slow and then rock it up. It might be really popular and then drop up or have a bump in the middle. It's the different models of how exciting a show is over time. Uh, network style. I'm gonna say decay even though it doesn't necessarily just go down. Or evolution of attraction <laughs> popularity over time. I love the detailedness of coming up with a board game and some of the very technical concepts and terms that we're using here. Hmm. Senior Baub says, do you have to earn the title of tycoon? Ooh, what's like a pre-tycoon? So I I'm getting a little bit of a vibe of like a snake oil salesman. Uh, eventually growing and leaning up to Tycoon. So you're starting off as someone kind of wheeling and dealing. Wheeling and dealing. And you have to build up to actually become the Tycoon. Like that. Chris says, not specifically roadside, but when people travel, they'll often seek out places of history and or legend. There's a story behind a place. What if you're manufacturing that to bring in tourism. Fake ghost stories. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're local to Seattle or the Pacific Northwest, one of my favorites is Leavenworth, which is this, I've never actually been, but I've heard a lot of people talking about it. It's a German style town in North Middle Washington, I believe, that actually has no German heritage. Uh, it, it was just, they, I think they pulled out of a hat a couple of different European city styles they could go after and they just settled on German. 
and now it's basically uh, an Epcot Center representation of um, of a small German village. They celebrate. It's very touristy. They celebrate Christmas there. They have like lights up all around the year. So that's this idea of either starting from the seed of a legend and building that out, or even just like Chris said, totally manufacturing the legend from scratch about what's so cool about this place. It's in your bottle, but keep adding qualifiers to your attraction names. At first, it's Alligator History Museum becomes the Haunted Crocodile History Museum. Ooh. Uh, and then eventually, <laughs> it becomes the epically haunted crocodile and alligator museum of of uh, awesome historical contextness. Mm. All of this is make me make me think of um, Ripley's, believe it or not. <laughs> if you like tourist attractions, or even if you're not a huge fan, Ripley's, believe it not, or not, is definitely one that you will have come across if you've gone to the, any of these touristy locations. I I actually really enjoy them and I feel very nostalgic because I've been to them all across the world and what's nice is they often have one or two unique things but they also have the same thing in a lot of them so you see like the dude with the largest shoe or uh, the same skeleton of a mermaid right so you know it's all kind of fake it's all reproductions but it's still, at this point for me at least, it just feels super nostalgic going through there uh, and remembering all the times I've gone to the other Ripley's Believe It or Not and had this same kind of fun, interesting experience. <laughs> Senior Bob says, I like the idea of traveling to investigate different local cryptids. I like that. I like a mashup of these two ideas where maybe you're inventing the cryptids. I think you go either way with those. Because uh, it could definitely be more the same old, same old, right? It's like, oh, there's the chupacabra and there's the Bigfoot. And there's the, oh, uh, what else is there? Yeti. Oh, I guess it's kind of like the Bigfoot. And just calling out to these same things. So I, I think for these more, these themes, well-known themes, putting a twist on them can be fun. So if you, like, invent a whole new crop of, or Loch Ness Monster, right? You can invent a whole new crop of cryptids. That could be fun and cool. Okay. Whew. So, I've come up with a lot of stuff for this potentially traveling, definitely roadside attraction, museum, Americana nostalgia game. Traveling and collecting, putting these things up, maybe having a cryptid or um, manufactured ghost story element to these kinds of things that we are creating and talking about. Hmm. So much to unpack. Yeah. This is the point of the stream where I'm like, man, now I've got like three and a half potential new game ideas to work on. And I want to work on them all. And funnily or not funnily enough, where I do the stream and generate all these ideas, like this part is very fun and exciting and especially working with you all, which thank you again, I really appreciate having someone to bounce ideas off of and come up with stuff. I think that we get a lot of really good juicy ideas here. And one of the trickier parts can be actually putting that down into prototype form, figuring out what that is, exactly how it plays, and then of course testing it and playing it and finding the fun for all those different pieces that we're working on. 
Um, yeah, so we're coming to the part where potentially going to prototype some of this stuff. I find myself <laughs> at a crossroads. Chris just says, oh, so now we just make, make all of it. Yeah, I would have... I'm going to bring over my tab with my game design concepts over here. I was just pruning this a little bit and seeing all the stuff that I could potentially work on or all the stuff that I want to work on. My list of ideas is long. I have this. I have all the concepts that I've worked on for my game a day, prototyping when I was doing that, all sorts of things, ideas and stuff floating around. Uh, yeah, so when we're talking about actually moving on to the prototype of a, I'm at a crossroads of a couple of potential directions to go into. We did a little bit of prototyping for the Truth of Science game, uh, where we had come up with a concept of using a hand of cards to be able to prove or disprove funny, not really scientific facts. Um, and I'd come up with a bit of a prototype for that. But now with this new map transportation game, that could be fun to go straight into that and do a little bit of prototyping of the map stuff. This is cool. I believe Chris had mentioned the now boarding map. Um, get rid of some of these tabs and the stuff around. So here you can see what Chris was saying because luckily Fowers Games, we have the map right here. So we can see a concept of uh, just picking out some key locations and a little bit of flavor in here. Um, pretty simplified routing as opposed to, you don't have to pick every city on the map, right? So this is a great way if we go back and forth between these two, like actual US map, and then the now boarding map. Um, you can pick out, especially for flying, some of the hubs. I didn't do every airport here, you know, they have JFK here as opposed to LaGuardia. So you can make some choices there of not having to put every single city on the map. Um, choose your favorite cities, right? Well, Seattle is on the now boarding map, which I am appreciative of. Seattle is also uh, a bigger city in the Pacific Northwest. So you have a nice anchor type thing over there. Um, Let's just start playing around with this map. I think we got nothing to lose, right? So I like to mention on the stream, and what was this? Uh, roadside tycoons. Yeah, there we go. I like to talk about on the stream, it's often good to let ideas sink in and mature over time so you have the chance to think and let them percolate a little bit to see exactly where you want to go with that. Uh, but one of the downsides of that is it can be easy to have all these really cool fun ideas from an activity like this brainstorm stream and then get bogged down in wanting to come up with a perfect concept before you move forward with that. So let's actually switch over to our prototyping view. And what do we have in here right now? Okay, cool. And for this, we're going to have Photoshop up here so we can start to play around with some of these. Uh, transportation ideas with perfect it's a good size get this okay. yeah let's get a new window in here with Photoshop because it is being sad about demonstrating Photoshop photos 
I love using OBS for things, but it likes to uh, not show this stuff some of the time, especially for Photoshop. I'm just going to get a window view, I think. Yeah, there we go. Get our faces back in here. Cool. Okay. Yeah, we're doing it. I'm excited. So let's go into... Let's just put a map on a board, right? What better, better way to get started than just like throwing a map on it? <laughs> put a map on it, right? Like put a bird on it. So we can get a new layer in here. Again, with this kind of live board game design, we don't know where we're going with this. We don't know necessarily the cities we're going to pick out, whether it's going to be routing, making, locations in new places, or what have you. But we can start with a map, right? Maybe this will end up being a board, maybe it'll be a card, but we can play around with it. Oh, that's actually a really good thing to consider at this point. We had talked about mostly moving across the map, setting up these different locations where you try to create attractions, but there's different ways that you could portray this. For example, have it be like a, a deck builder of locations and items that's so all card based, or you could have it be uh, a map and have it be tokens that you're putting down. You could have uh, different pieces of a country, your own map that you're filling in with like a puzzle with different pieces. A lot of fun stuff that you could do here. Um, I think first of all, we're going to start to get a little outline of the country here. <laughs> Let's say as good as my country drawing skills are. <laughs> We'd see and get my notebook up here again to show off <laughs> my countries with Texas. Texas mysteriously having vanished. Uh, one of the good ways to get a very rough look is to do a quick outline trace uh, of the country so we can have our map to look at here uh, and then toggle it on and off so we can start to look at the map both with the whole road map on it And then have our outline as well, so we can see something a little less distracting. Uh, Judge that a little bit. It's like, do we need New York in there? Maine is an important part of it, being pretty... <laughs> I like that I give a little more weight to the places that I like or that I've been to or lived in before. It's like, uh, just give a little, for this whole middle area, it's like, oh, you just kind of eyeball that. And like, but Maine, Maine needs to be in there. Oh yeah, that was the other thing. I kind of, in my drawing, I just kept, I'm like, there's nothing really in this top middle part. If you do trace around it, there's the Great Lakes is a very important iconic piece of the country. Uh, I want to do this fast. I want to keep it quick and dirty. That's another important thing to remember about prototyping. Perfect. Pass. Make a selection. Uh. Let's just do a black stroke 
on that. Uh, let's make it a little bigger than that. This is a pretty high resolution image we got here. Okay, let's, let's make it like 67. All right, cool. Cool, so we got a map, sweet. So as we're moving forward with this, obviously this isn't necessarily going to be our final thing, but we can start to take our map uh, and put on locations, right? Have a cities folder where we start to throw some of them down. This is the fun part too, where we can play around with, um, <laughs> it's like, what cities do we want to include? in this place. Um, I can just do text here. Ooh, this is actually fun. Huh. It's probably a good font size. San Francisco. I like San Francisco. Uh, just see how that looks. I should probably put a dot. <laughs> Thinking like, what's the best way to represent these places? It's like, I don't put a dot there, I'm gonna forget exactly where San Francisco is. It's like it's in this general vicinity. Big old dot. San Francisco. All right. Moving on, what other cities do we like? Let me check in the chat and see if there's anything. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's not much in the Midwest. Yeah, there's, uh, I think I'm going to have to go back to the actual full resolution one because resolution on here is a little low. Uh, we got Denver. Denver is cool. Salt Lake City is fun. Uh, Topeka, <laughs> Kansas City. Memphis, uh, I've heard of that. Albuquerque, Al Albuquerque, Kirky, Albuquerque. I think that's right. So lots of fun stuff there. All right. So we do have some notes in the chat that I want to go over because talking a little bit, going back and forth between the mechanical and the actual physical prototyping layout that we have here. Uh, Chris has an important point from a design perspective of what the inner loop looks like. So we're talking about the grand scale of things generally, um, starting at the different cities, putting stuff there, end of the game scoring, but what does each round or turn looks like? So it has to be something of, uh, from a high level perspective of what a system would look like, be um, starting to look at how do you get to a location? Is it actual movement across the country? How do you claim a location? So that'd be travel, maybe, element of that, uh, earning or collecting the resources to claim a thing. So if we're looking at a game like Ticket to Ride, there's sections on the route, you're picking up the cards, which are your claiming resources. So it'd be a claiming element of the, the loop, actual earning or scoring, where you would get the select, set collection piece, if that's the direction we end up going in. Uh, and that would be the core loop, and you would keep doing that until the game is done. Also, what does winning look like? What does success look feel like? What does failure feel like? What do we think the joy differentiating moment is going to be? How are we going to help happen early and often. And that's an important thing when you're looking at these core gameplay loops. Uh, and even when you're starting to do your first prototype, what is going to be the core fun of this? So, and again, in my head, I'm thinking that you're going to be putting stuff down on the actual city as opposed to the routes in a ticket to ride type of a way. So if that is the direction we end up going, uh, there's a few parts of that that are kind of uh, build up and resolution, which is a very fun 
general style of gameplay, right? Over the turns, the cards are flipped. I get to see the ones that I'm collecting. I'm looking at my hand. It's got a little bit of push your luck element, right? Because I can hold on to this to get a better one, but I kind of need that one as well. So it's kind of like the buildup and then the resolution of actually claiming the thing. I could see a similar loop working in this sort of a game where either through some sort of tokens or money, you would claim a city and the right to put down an attraction. Maybe you're claiming the city, cities and the attractions over time. Um, going back to the touring roadside, because we're still not totally down on whether it's going to be the touring game or the building roadside tycoon sort of a game. Probably looks like pulling off some epic route of fun by the seat of your pants, skirting with hangry disaster. For putting up the roadside direction attractions, probably looks like people streaming it endlessly to your hilariously mediocre monstrosity while you sell them hot dogs. <laughs> then your bottom, oh wait, sidebar. Wait, put a bird on it? Yeah, I don't know what that's from. It's a saying. It's probably a meme or something. I mostly just hear people repeating these things to me, and then I, I see them as well, not entirely knowing what they mean, which is probably, probably potentially dangerous. Partial to Minneapolis, uh, which is in Minnesota, I believe. <laughs> which I definitely totally know where Minnesota is. Uh, so spoiler alert for this whole thing, uh, my geography <laughs> is questionable. Uh, it's near Missouri, right? Where is Minneapolis? Oh my gosh. Uh, Michigan, there's so many M states. Oh, wait, there it is. Ha ha ha. Found it. Nailed it. It's near St. Paul. Cool. Uh, I believe it's right up there. Cool. <laughs> so as I go into this, I'm like, I'm going to make a game about maps and stuff. Uh, new layer. So this is going to be the Minneapolis. Yeah, I'm definitely, uh, I think it was like right there, right? Definitely had some issues with geography over the years. Mostly because I just felt like it was arbitrary for a lot of our classes, right? It's just like, so just remember this because it will be useful someday. And then Google Maps became a thing, and it was never useful to know this stuff ever again. I mean, it's still kind of useful. Oops. Uh, Denver dot, right. Uh, Denver. I like Denver. I like Colorado. This whole uh, kind of southwest quadrant of the country, I think it's really cool. Really fun. Right, so we're going back and forth between putting dots on our city map slowly but surely and then looking at some of our design chat over here getting back to our mechanics <laughs> senior bob says maybe it's a little dead of winter where it's a cooperative but you have your own objectives the players are the members of a family and each person has things they want to see that other players might not care about. I like that as well. Uh, get back to, whoops. Today's. Hmm. I was gonna say I haven't worked on a lot of cooperative games, but I, ha I realize every time I say that half of my published games are cooperative because I have two published games and one of them is cooperative. Uh, it's a storytelling game, so I don't really think about it in that way very much, but I think it's a very interesting style of gameplay. Definitely something I want to play around with a little bit, because I really like playing cooperative games. Managing the needs of... Oh, let's 
switch my view here. So we're back into the notes section. Managing the needs of different family members. Everyone wants to see different things. And also, it's hangry. I don't know if it's because it's close to dinner or what, but everybody's really focusing on food now, myself included. Wants to see different things and also gets hangry. Uh, you have to plot the best route as a family to see the things you want to see. Oh man, it could be, uh, what is it, coopetitive? It could also be competitive cooperative where you have hidden goals. Uh, I like that thing where, for example, you want to see the, just the most attractions, right? And you're trying to keep your hidden objective not entirely known by the other people who are playing the game. So for, for example, see the most attractions. So you're pushing to go to a particular place, right? It's like, oh, wow, the ball of yarn, I really want to go there. And everyone's like, oh, I'm not really a huge fan of that. I'm like, it's so close though. We just should go. It's just around the corner. And then you go there and then next one, they're like, oh my gosh, the big ball of cheese. And over time you're starting to realize like, you just want to go anywhere, right? Uh, and then you could bluff and trick them a little bit, right? Like, oh, I'm not a big fan of that. Or, uh, yeah, maybe you're just the person who is very hangry or likes to eat a lot of the time, so you want to stop at all of the food-related attractions. Chris says, put a bird on it is from Portlandia. Uh, and that definitely shows that I observe this, absorb this from listening to other people, because I've never seen Portlandia. Which is weird, because I'm in the Pacific Northwest now. Apparently, it really resonates if you have been in this area, know what people here are like. Um, yeah, so we're doing a little bit of prototyping here. I think if we go back to this map, we're starting to build out. So here we see we're building this over time and not entirely sure the idea of what the game is going to look like is still forming in, in our heads and in our minds. So we can look at starting to put some cities on the map. I'm going to put a few on here and then I'm going to play around with what it might look like uh, graphically to either move between these cities. Uh, or potentially to not have a movement element to it. And the important part is just um, claiming the cities. So two core potential directions. Uh, again, whether we're doing the traveling to the different locations on the board or making the attractions on these places, like movement, are we gonna have to move between the places. Is that going to be a consideration? Is there going to be limited movement? A lot of these questions come up when we're starting to put this together. Uh, right. So right now we're in Denver. I'm going to make a dot. Dot for Dallas. The Dallas dot. Dallas. And I'm doing this this way mostly because I like working in Photoshop and also for the stream it's a little easier and visual to see. Uh, but you could also just scratch this out on a piece of paper or do different things. <clears throat> um, I want to do 
Like, mm. yeah. Do like a area control sort of a thing here. So for example, I was using Ticket to Ride as uh, something that might work for this, where you make the routes between the different cities, have little rectangles that are, uh, sure, that represent the places where you actually have to put your train cards, which is a kind of cool thing for Ticket to Ride in particular, because you're, you filled in that and it's a very visual graphic thing. If we're not worried too much about movement in particular for this, we could do more of a area control sort of thing where I get to put my pieces, ah, whoops, that's weird. Mm. Let's actually, US map. Uh, which one is? <laughs> I'm like, where's my map here? Oh, the map is including the San, I put the San Francisco dot in the map. Cool. Anyways, let's lock down the map so we can move around these sections. Mm. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, if we don't want to worry too much about routing or movement, we could have some sections here where you're gonna put uh, something to claim, either it's cubes or it's meeples, and we could have these around, oops. Have these claimable sections around the different cities, and each one has a cost, you know, for the number of units you have to put into there. It could be like a, a money or a claiming or other potential ways of saying like, hey, this city is mine. And alternately to that, we could think a little bit more like the Takedo example that we did in the beginning of the stream. where we're doing a movement over time. Uh, and just have different lines and routes going between the different city. And either having it be so you can start at any city and you're just kind of bopping around to wherever you want to go. There's a Oh, there we go. Make that little uh, too big, too big. Sure. Yeah, have it be moving between the cities. You have a certain number of units of movement. Perhaps you have a direction to the, the movement, so you always have to move from east to west, and each route will show you like the directions you can go. So there's an absolute progression there or um, there can be another end condition to the game. It's like once a certain number of spots are filled. Um, so looking at a map like this, either direction that we're going in could potentially work with this. So you have different slots that are being filled. Maybe if you are traveling to a place, there's a limited number of souvenirs or pictures that could be collected. And those could be represented by these rectangles here. Or there could be you're trying to claim a city you're trying to put a certain number of units there. Maybe the units are like people, maybe they're persuasion. <laughs> so we're talking about being able to put your attraction in the city. Maybe you have to persuade the city members that you're the best one, best suited to put this particular attraction here. Um, and make note of that. Claiming a city with persuasion or with your workers. So even starting out with a map like this, there's a couple of different directions that you can go with this.
here we go. How these different lines and routes connecting the different cities if we decide to go in the movement direction. <laughs> Welcome to the chat, Bobacus. Uh, Bobacus very astutely points out this map is missing some cities, I think. Also, sup. Wait, this is the total accurate map of the US. Minneapolis, San Francisco, Denver, and Dallas. That's our entire country, right? Uh, for those of you who might just be tuning in, we're working off of this map here. Uh, our idea is to make either a game about roadside attractions, either visiting them as a tourist, or potentially being the person, the tycoon, or future tycoon, who sets up these cities across the country. Uh, so we're looking to balance between the filledness of the board and also mechanically just laying out a couple of cities here to see how this mechanically might work. From a prototyping perspective, uh, it's really good to figure out mechanically how these things are going to connect together before you get too, too detailed uh, in laying all, out all the different instances. I'll tell you right now, uh, for me, looking at this map, I am very excited of the game of putting down the dots and the cities and making it look really cool. I think that's an impulse as a creator, as a designer. Each of us has certain things we can get excited about uh, and things that are often easier, I guess, easier, more methodical. It's like, oh, I could build out this map and make it look really cool. But first, we want to figure out how exactly this is going to work mechanically and specifically the question we're asking here a uh, couple of questions do we care about routing and moving from city to city and are we touring these cities um, trying to take pictures and collect and gain uh, gain the both best souvenirs from visiting these or are we actually the people who are building the attractions so those are our main design questions we're looking to figure out and move forward on before we uh, decide to make our map look really pretty. Senior Baub says, I have a voting mechanic idea that seems like it would fit that design path. Ooh, I'm excited about voting mechanics. Basically, each round there are six options, and each player has a hand of cards that has three options, each as numbers slash letters. The players choose a card that best matches what suits them and plays it. The number letter with the highest tally is the option that wins. Interesting. So that one, it sounds like maybe this is for the cooperative option because it seems like everyone is voting on going to a different place. Uh, reminds me a little of the uh, initiative priority order from Gloomhaven. Uh, also, the game that I played fairly recently that I want to call Pharaoh, that I don't think it's called Pharaoh, has an Egyptian theme, but it's got a really cool mechanic of how the cards are held in your hand. You have a handful of cards, but you only play the ones on the outside edges, so you have like a limited option selection hand management thing that you're doing. Uh, but still can kind of plan out your path for the future. Um, yeah. Let's pop back over to our notes here and write some of this down. A uh, really cool way to approach your prototyping and your design is to go back and forth between a little bit of writing written either in a doc, Google Doc like this, or in an actual physical paper notebook, you start to think mechanically for each of the different pieces and the loops you're trying to create, the direction you want to go into, and then actually come back to your components or pieces and see what that might look like. I think organically bouncing between those two, uh, for me who is easily distracted, might be a little bit normal, more normal of a design technique. Uh, but that definitely helps me stay motivated and have both the components and the mechanics evolve together uh, organically over time. 
Chris says you can be dealt a bunch of cards at the beginning of the game that represent your family. They're essentially secret objectives. Little Sally really wants to see the giant dinosaur museum. Little Bobby only eats french fries. I love, uh, if you're just tuning in, we were talking a lot about Americana and nostalgia at the beginning of this stream. And the little Bobby Sally thing definitely fits into that. I like the objectives thing if we're thinking about visiting these different attractions. Um, and we're talking about cooperative or even coopetitive, so cooperative and competitive with different people being in the family. But Chris, I actually like this idea of each person has their own family with different objectives that they're trying to balance. Um, so the cards and maintaining that could be a pretty cool strategic thing. Babacus says, I love Fury of Dracula's map. Uh, your Instagram models trying to get the most followers. Nice. Fury of Ooh. Oh, nice. Yeah, that is super cool looking. And this one, to me, I, I imagine they still do cover some of the cities, but I like the idea of being a little bit flexible with the map. And I think it's an important thing to look here at um, mechanical versus thematic, how closely you want to be tied to, you know, exactly where the cities are. Can I hold the overlay of a map up to the thing? And does it look like things are in exactly the right place versus does it overall have the feeling that I want to evoke and mechanically does it work? That can be a boon of using an actual physical map is that you have a lot of stuff to lean on, it's instant recognition, it can convey a lot of the theme, but a drawback of using an actual physical real world map is people can get a little caught up about exactly where things are and you are a little more beholden to the layout of that map. <laughs> Senior Bob says, wasn't this Field DR's game? Yes. Um, Feel the yards. It's gonna bother me now. Anytime where I can't. Luxor, that's what it was. Remember the name of the game. I was very impressed with that. I mean, obviously, Spiel the Yards games are often consistently very good, uh, but it always it can always catch me off guard when I, when I play one. Because I'm pretty sure Azul was one with just how elegant and clever it can be, even if the theme or the media appearance seems a little weird at first. <laughs> Senior Bob says, Chris, let's eat at the Onion Ring pal Palace. I don't know, do they have french fries there? Little Bobby might not be super into that. Do All right, let's pop over to our map one last time. So I think we're in a good place here. We have the, the seeds, the beginnings of a couple different games. Uh, for me, potentially moving forward with this design, I am still up in the air whether I am most excited now about the building of the roadside attractions or the road trip traveling element. Um, I feel like the, the road tripping element mechanically and thematically will come a little quick, more quickly and easily to me. I can kind of see a road forward, especially with some of these hidden objective ideas. I think there's a lot of fun stuff to play around with there. For the building of the roadside attractions, I think there's fun stuff there as well. Especially with the claiming these, you can make some really cool flavor there. I think it's gonna be a slightly heavier and more mechanical game. Um, which I think like throwing a lot, a lot of like the coffee spills, the hangry, the highs and lows, a little bit more of the kind of games that I like to design. So I see myself moving forward with that. That being said, I want to let it sit and percolate a little bit more. I have my map here, have some ideas of the cards and locations, the movement that might exist, different mechanics for creating that. So 
had a lot of fun stuff to play around with. Uh, I think I'm going to leave it and as I mentioned before, let it percolate, percolate a little bit and germinate a little bit and see where I come down with all these ideas. Uh, as always, really appreciate everyone joining me for this stream. It's tons of fun. I feel like I get a lot of really great ideas. Uh, I hope you get some good ideas as well. If you see anything in this stream that sparks an idea, feel free to hop on that. All of these are just concepts. None of them have been claimed by anybody. Uh, if both of us, or both of us, <laughs> me and you, the viewer, if all of us took this country traveling idea and made a different game from it, it would be completely different games uh, and probably all very fun, which is one of the exciting things about board game design is you can start with a, a concept and build out from there and come up with really unique, fun stuff. So hope this is fun for everyone. Hope it's inspiring for everyone. I definitely suggest if you're ever stuck on ideas, uh, you don't necessarily have to stream it, although it would be awesome if you did. You can do this design challenge exercise, starting with our mind map. Uh, doing a mind map exercise, bouncing some ideas off of people, throwing a bunch of stuff out there, going in a direction, making a little bit of a prototype so you have something to come back to, uh, and in general, just getting those creative juices flowing. Because even if this uh, roadside tycoon game never comes completely to fruition, we will have done design. And I think that's a really important thing to close out with is that we have done game design. We have participated in game design today. Uh, I've designed a game, you've designed a game. So for anyone who might feel a little nervous about the design process or not entirely sure how to progress, you're seeing it. this right here. This is game design uh, at work. This is game design in real time. And really appreciate you all joining me as always. Uh, I'm here every Tuesday doing more of this design, coming up with more cool stuff. I post on Twitter as Emma Larkins, moving forward with these designs and other designs. You can kind of see how they evolve over time. Uh, so it's really good, fun and useful and happy to be able to share the process. Before I tag out, uh, Balagus asks, how would you make a mechanic that allows players to predict the future? Oh, you're signing off, okay. No, 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 that's totally cool. I'm very happy to answer these questions. Mm. It's an interesting question. Um, I think that with my game, and then we died. It is a little bit future-y, predict-y. So if you haven't seen And Then We Died, it's a cooperative storytelling game where he plays ghosts trying to figure out how we died together so we can pass on to the other side. It has these word fragment cards. Uh, and each time someone lays down a card, they point to someone who continues the story based on the words that are laid out there. So this is a game that I made, but it's also a cool tool that you could use it in the game. You're actually using it to tell the past, but you could also use it as a tool to say like, hey, we're predicting the future. So anything that you're using different tools or game components to make words is a cool way to predict the future. I'm also a big fan of anything that's like uh, tarot, like rolling the bones, for this question in particular, I would do a lot of research into ways that people have predicted the future uh, in the past with like um, different sticks. Like they have, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue what it's actually called, but there's a lot of um, future telling science where you like throw a bunch of sticks or rocks or components onto the ground and actually trace out the shape. Uh, there's Numer numerology and uh, something geomancy, I think it might be. Uh, yeah, if you look up Wikipedia is a great resource for the ways that people have predicted the future and start with that mechanically as a basis for the things you want to do. I personally think it's a super cool idea and you can play around with a lot of really fun mechanics uh, with that. 
Uh, Bobka says, oh, maybe everyone gets a card and shuffles it into a deck of events. Oh, not the actual future events of the game. Ooh, I like this take, though. Oh, that... Using the randomness of a deck and uh, asymmetrical limited information that the different players have, I think is super cool. And uh, with that in particular, if that's the direction that you're going in, there's a couple of different ways you can do of uh, deck manipulation, of deck observation, where you might get more information over time. Being able to like look at the cards, position the cards, have um, your in this case, you're basically playing around with how much information each player knows and how much information do I know that they know. Because uh, I think that a lot of games do use positioning of certain cards in a deck as a really cool mechanic for a timer. Uh, a lot of times, like, you'll shuffle a certain card into the last four cards of the deck. So there's modulated or limited randomness. Uh, I think there's a lot of fun stuff. You can do that. I realized I didn't change my window so you can actually see what I'm looking at. Yeah, so I was talking about it and then we died. Particular one way of telling the future. But yeah, playing around with positioning of cards and decks. It also has a little bit of a feel of like a magic trick, right? Like so they show you a card, it's the ace, and they shuffle it into the deck. Uh, and they're trying to figure out where in the deck that is. I think there's a lot of cool stuff you can play around with that. So yeah, I had a really fun time hanging out with everybody today. If you ever have any design questions, want to get my take on things, always happy to answer on the stream or on Twitter. You can check me out at Emma Larkins. I'm here doing design stuff every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Uh, hopefully more design streams in the future. But for now, I am signing off. This is Emma Larkins, and I will see you around the table.